This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. And welcome, welcome here live with Dr. Jeff Weber here on Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets with Dr. Jeff. We're here for you. We're here for your pets. So easy way to get a hold of us. We're also here doing our live simulcast on my Instagram live. And I'm waving to all my friends. So as I reach over, I'm just waving back to you. So anyway, how to get a hold of us here. Well, first of all, you can join me live on Instagram, but better yet, PetLifeRadio.com. You go to shows and you scroll down to Ask the Best with Dr. Jeff. And there's going to be a link left for you there by our producer, Mark. You can join us here live. Great to have your pet with you. I mean, this is kind of telemedicine at its finest, really, when you think about it. And we can talk about anything you want to talk about. You can also call us toll-free, 877-385-8882. Once again, 877-385-8882. And uh, again, for Instagram, you can, if you have any questions, anything that you want to talk about, now's the time, post it. It's hard to join live because then what happens is it takes up half the screen and the only way you can turn it off is you. So we're not going to do that now, but you can always get a hold of me here on Instagram. Uh, would love to talk to you, love to uh, help you with your problems. So if you have any questions or anything you want to talk about, you can just post it. I'm kind of checking my screen back and forth. So um, we will get you either way, either here on Instagram or here on Pet Life Radio. So as you know, I like to peruse the news, see what's going on. I use uh, two sources, the American Veterinary Medical Association Smart Brief. I also use the AHA News Stat and saw some interesting stories. <laughs> and this one, I'm going to let you make out what you want, but here's the story. It's a, it's a good one. It says, it's got, I call it a fun fact. Domesticated cat brains are smaller than the brains of their wild ancestors. Now, we know that cats are pretty smart. We know that, you know, first of all, their hearing is amazing. What dogs have, as far as a sense of smell, cats have with their hearing. And when you think about it, they, they need that because, you know, when they're, they're being hunted or they're hunting, regardless, they need to have, a, you know, good ears. They're always listening. But I thought that it's interesting. And now what's funny is the wild ancestors, while their snout and body lengths relative to size has remained stable. So that means relative to their body size and their snout, the domesticated cats have smaller brains. Now, maybe they have more packed in those brains. Who knows? I wonder from a standpoint of evolution, I can understand maybe because they knew we were going to be stupid enough to start breeding their faces smaller and take those Persians and Himalayans and make them so pushed in that they can't breathe anymore. Who knows? So they said, you know what? We better make room for that. So we're going to make the brain a little smaller. Anyway, I just thought it was kind of funny. Any comments about that? We'd love to hear. Why do you think the domesticated cats have smaller brains than their ancestors? And, and yet they're pretty smart. Unless I don't know thing we think of. They don't have to know as much. They don't have to fend for themselves because you have p- people like me, the five cats in the house, and give them everything they want. They don't have to think about anything. So maybe who knows? That could be it. So um, speak about cats. This is, now, this is a good story. All right. Parents of children who have the autism spectrum disorder, ASD, all right, say their children, this is so amazing. Their children became more sociable and empathetic and exhibited fewer concerning behaviors within 18 weeks of adopting a cat. And that's amazing. And also, interestingly, the cats in the study seem to thrive. So they kind of work off each other. You know, look, we all know how amazing animals are. And when we talk about their senses, and we have our five, they have who knows how many. I was walking outside yesterday, and I saw one of my patients, and just their eyesight's not good right? But their hearing is pretty good. And she heard my voice and she went bonkers, like literally charged over to me, jumping up on me, wagging her tail, licking me in the face. So they sense we kind of work off of each other. So you wonder what is going on with these autistic kids and the bond that they can form with cats because they took other cats that were adopted out to regular you know, homes without autistic children. And they did not seem to thrive as well. So I mean, you think about it. That's amazing stuff, both from the point, the perspective of these autistic kids and also the perspective of how our animals sense certain things and seem to respond. And in a case like this, respond extremely, extremely favorably. And that's really cool. Now, I have two COVID facts. What would be a show here on Pet Life Radio during these difficult times without some COVID stories? So just to, to let you have it. So, so I call it, these are our must COVID facts. So a research team in a Minnesota test, they, uh, they tested bats, coyotes, mice, squirrels, and of course, white-tailed deer. And listen to this. They found infection in, only, uh, in the deer, the 142 deer tested only nine 
tested positive, which it was actually pretty good because earlier on, and this leads us to be another story that the white-tailed deer seem to be a one of the potential reservoirs. They can actually pass COVID on to each other. There have yet to be any reports of them passing it on to people. But then again, when you think about it, how close are any of you or any of me getting to a white-tailed deer to where we can pass this on? But our reservoir, and they've proven because in closed environments, there are a number, a large number of deer that were getting the COVID virus. So they had to have been, been coming from each other. So that is uh, interesting. And the other thing is in another study, about only about three dozen of the 5,000, check that out, 5,000 specimens collected from dogs, cats, and horses with respiratory illnesses, only about three dozen tested positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So most had only clinical signs of the illness, all right? And as I've mentioned before, and the AVMA just put another statement out that there have been no cases of animals transmitting the virus to us. There are cases of us giving it to our pets, and we know that, especially cats. Dogs, someone just asked me the other day about dogs, and there are very few, it's hard to tell. My feeling is dogs don't, we, don't, we know dogs don't get sick from it. Now, if they were exposed, and let's say someone in the household had it and contacted the dog, the virus is still there. So if you're testing, if dog licks you or whatever, so that virus is not going to cause an illness in the dog. But if you tested the dog at that time, within a day or two of having contracted or, or come in contact with their person who was shedding the virus, they may test positive, but we're not seeing any clinical signs. So I'm really not that worried about dogs. I'm not worried about my cats either. And uh, so, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where you know it's there, but don't think about getting rid of a dog or, or even a cat because of COVID. What you should do, however, especially with cats, if someone, you or someone in your household tests positive, then what you want to do is you want to back off, try to minimize the contact with your cat. I remember when one of my cats had um, hyperthyroidism and he had, we had to separate him because after his uh, radioactive iodine, the 131 treatment, we had to keep him kind of like alone because of a us and the other cats. So we had, we, we had a, you know, a guest bathroom. We put him in there and um, we had wore gloves and we had to keep the litter. You have to be very careful. You couldn't throw the litter. It either had to be flushable litter. You had to sit on it for like two weeks and then you could throw it out after all the radioactivity was gone. Anyway, so basically had to have his own, you know, his own little uh, isolation ward. So you can do it. So if you or somebody else in the household has COVID, then you might want to um, go ahead and just kind of, again, minimize the contact you have with your cat. So that's, uh, that's important. But dogs, I wouldn't worry too much about. Um, as I said, there's been, there have been no studies to date about dogs. So um, I know I wouldn't worry too much. Now, next up, what are they going to come up with next? That's the question. Of the, what are they going to come up with next? So here's it. Now, I've seen, you know, you know, I do a lot of Frenchies. I have like over 300 in my practice. I have lasers. So I'm doing, you know, the nares. I'm doing the soft palates and the and I, tonsils and all that stuff. And um, I have Frenchie. My son has two Frenchies. They're, I love them. They're great dogs. So I just recently, last week, I saw a long-haired Frenchie. I also did a post with, you may have seen it on Instagram, and it is a, it's a $10,000 Frenchie. Let's put it that way. I mean, that's, a, that's an expensive dog. It was a chocolate merle with oh, what they call it. I, it. It's such a weird name. It was a chocolate merle with some three different colored tip points or something. The thing had so many colors, you couldn't even count. But it was really, really cute. I mean, adorable. So now I also had a long hair Frenchie that I saw two weeks ago. And then this is the story. So check this out. Now what? A litter of hairless Frenchie, French bulldogs in the UK. Can you imagine? getting hairless Frenchies. I don't know how what they crossed them with. Again, they might be healthy, but just know that if you're thinking about getting a hairless Frenchie, now there are, besides the problems that Frenchies already have with their breathing and their allergies. I just came from a conference. I was in Crested Butte, Colorado. The Colorado Veterinary Medical Association puts on an annual SCICE Ski CE. It was fantastic. And um, I, from you know, Ski CE for me, it was Snowboard CE. But I mean, check this out. This is what like, continuing education is all about, where you can go to sessions early in the morning, 6.30 to 9, have a little breakfast, light, light breakfast and, and session. And then you get to be on the slopes from 9 to 4. For me, it was 9 to 3 because I had to fit that little hot tub in. And then sessions from 4 to 6 or 4 to 7. It was amazing. And um, I found it about six years ago, and I've been going every year, except last year it was canceled because of COVID, but it's a great conference. So, you know, we talk about, you know, all these issues. It was about dermatology and otology. So, you know, again, we know there are a lot, a lot of problems with the Frenchies and their allergies. 
Um, I think they're taken over. You know, it used to be Westies, like Westies, we know are very allergenic, uh, and the Scotties have a lot of allergies. You know, Sharpays have their skin issues. Well, guess what? Maybe because the numbers of Frenchies we're seeing, but this guy was saying that Frenchies are now starting to lead the list, which is, you know, I mean, it's good and bad at the same time. They're very popular, maybe too popular. But anyway, if you have a hairless Frenchie, now you're dealing with heat issues. You're dealing with you know, like overheating issues. You're dealing with skin sensitivity to sun issues. And then when they get hot, what happens when dogs get hot, when they get overheated? They pant. Well, now you have a Frenchie that can't breathe very well in the first place, and you're going to make him pant? Oh, my God. He's going to overheat like crazy. So it's one of those things where we really need to kind of take a step back. And really decide, wait a second, what do we want to breed for? Again, just look at what we've done to the Persian cat. These poor kitties, with their noses are a little pinched, their faces are pushed in. <laughs> They're breathing like that. I mean, those poor little things. So um, anyway, that's something we have to keep in mind. So what they're saying, according to the British Veterinary Association, this study obviously came out of the UK, some mixed breeds that we talk about may be healthier, which is possible, than some of the pure breeds. However, careless crossbreeding say again, careless crossbreeding can provide offspring with a multiple of health problems also that weren't in the pure breed. So they say that, yeah, a lot of these mutts, you pick, you buy, you get a mutt from a shelter. They're very healthy because there are mutts. They got a little high 57. They have so many different things. They don't have any one set of genes from two parents of the same breed. Yeah, there might be a benefit there. But if you're going to do these crossbreeds, be careful because you know what? Also, when you think about it, let's look at the doodle, all right? Uh, someone sent me a character. I'd be very careful on the air about how I say this, but I had a picture of about 15 or 16, or who knows, it was a grid with all these little pictures of all these doodle crosses. And it says, <laughs> I'll try to lighten it up because what do we know about poodles? The question is, they'll sleep with anything. So, <laughs> so anyway, you get the picture that there are so many doodle crosses now. And um, uh, God, and, and also with the minis. Now, you know, my, <laughs> my daughter got a mini golden doodle. The thing is so cute. He's got these light eyes. You could see pictures of him on Instagram. He is so adorable. And, and it was a mini. So we have a picture of my daughter. When we first got it. He was so cute. He was so little. Yeah. Well, they were in last week. He's still 48 pounds. So everybody thought he was a mini, a mini, but he didn't read the book. Wherever those genes were coming from, he got dad's genes because dad was, was a, uh, a golden retriever. And this is one big, dog. I mean, he's adorable. Every, the kids love him. We love him. He gets along great with my dogs, but uh, be careful. You can, those minis may not always be minis. Anyway, when we come back, we're going to talk about, there was a story about cold weather. I want to talk about it, cold weather tips. And having just gotten you know, returned from Crested Butte, even though I'm here in Los Angeles, it's gorgeous today. Blue skies, not a cloud in the sky. It's going to be in the 70s. You know, we got the Rams playing the 49ers today at SoFi Stadium. You know, so we're all looking forward to that. But Crested Butte, I have a picture. It is an ice, all these ice figurines, including a bench. It looks like a bench, a park bench with a whole back to it made out of ice. We were there for four days, well, Sunday through Wednesday, four days. And I got to tell you, that thing is still there. I mean, it never gets above 32. This thing did not melt at all. And so it was really, really cold there. So um, I can tell you about cold weather and dogs. So when we come back, we're going to talk about some cold weather tips because I know in many parts of the country, it's cold out there. Be right back. Here is an alarming statistic. More than two-thirds of dogs and cats have oral health disease by the age of three. And one of the indicators is bad breath. Do your pets have a healthy mouth? Do you cringe when it's time for a kiss or a snuggle? Let's get to the cause. Harmful bacteria in their mouth. And bad breath is just the start. The bad bacteria cause tartar and oral disease, which can lead to serious overall health problems. It's critical to make sure your pet's oral health is the best it can be, as good dental health is key to optimizing their overall health. Now, good news. It's easy and affordable to improve their oral health with ProBiora Pet. Just one scoop of this dental care probiotic mixed into their food daily floods the mouth with positive bacteria, which crowds out the bad. This means better oral health and fresher breath. ProBiora Pet is an all-natural dental care probiotic. It's odor and taste-free, so your pets will still enjoy their chow. We want to keep your pets healthy. During National Pet Oral Health Month, our listeners can save 10%. Go to ProBiorapet.com and use PLR10 at checkout. That's ProBiorapet.com. Use PLR10 at checkout to save 10%. 
Let's Talk Pets. Let's Talk Pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. <laughs> Okay, so here we are back live with Dr. Jeff Werber here at Pet Life Radio's Ask the Vets to Dr. Jeff, live on my Instagram. Uh, we had a question about seizing, and uh, one of the things we talked about that depending on what causes a dog seizure. So there are many, many things. And, you know, typically, I, obviously, you can have like a, a meningitis, you can have encephalitis, you can have a brain mass, like a tumor. But I would say most of the seizures in dogs are because of epilepsy. And with epilepsy, you know, some of the ways to tell, first of all, all the tests are going to come back normal, all right? Even an MRI, everything's coming back normal. If you want to go that far to do CT MRI, um, from a practical standpoint, because a lot of people don't have the access to an MRI or CT or, or just can't afford it. It's very expensive. My criteria is how often are the seizures coming? And most importantly, when your dog is not seizing, is he or she totally normal in every way? And if that's the case, then very likely it's epilepsy. Secondly, if you can identify a certain trigger, all right, for example, my sister's dog would seize and they linked it to vomiting, that he would seize almost every time after vomiting. And he liked to eat grass. And every time he ate grass, he vomited. So duh, bing, 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 grass, vomiting, seizure. Let's stop the sucker from eating grass. And they did. And <laughs> it got those seizures under control. So it is, you know, if you can identify the trigger, usually we can't, but when you can, oh, that's even better because then you can, if you can, try to avoid it. So we, one of the things we talked about are some natural things, you know, brain food, antioxidants could help, and CBD. I mentioned CBD, and um, Riverhouse Frenchie says that she gives her dog CBDs and it works really well. So uh, thank you so much. So anyway, and in humans, by the way, and boy, human research when it comes to CBD or any of the THC, the, the, the cannabinoids is far more advanced than ours is. And one of the problems is there's so, there's so much variability nowadays and we don't, there's so much we don't know. They're being studied. A couple of vet schools I know, Colorado State, recreational use of marijuana was approved in Colorado way before most of the other states. So they're really working on it. I think UC Davis definitely also, where I went to school, is doing some work on it. So we will learn more right now you know, exercise caution, avoid the THC if you can. CBD is a lot safer. And um, and again, not that THC is bad. There may be some, some uses for it as well. We just don't know enough about it yet. And of course, we want to avoid toxicity. And that's the problem right now we're having in veterinary medicine is really avoiding the toxicity. But anyway, thanks for your comment. And that's great. So cold weather, as we know, I'll tell you how the story started. But and again, I know what it's like to be in cold weather because I just returned from it. But Dogs can freeze if left outside, if they have no access to shelter, all right, or warmth. Don't kid yourself. Don't think, well, my dog has long hair and, and he's an Arctic breed. Remember that great movie? It was so sad, Eight Below, I think it was called. Yeah, these sled dogs, oh, they can handle that well below freezing temperatures in the Antarctica, but, or in Alaska. The problem is when they're not moving, right, they can die. And we learned that from the movie. They were tied up. They couldn't move, couldn't exercise. And it is really, really sad. And the, the, a lot has to do with the dog. It's age, health condition, coat condition, coat length, activity level. So it really varies. There's a cute little Instagram. So dog, it's really cute. It's a big, you know, full, thick-coated Arctic dog. And uh, he curled up and fell asleep. And in the middle, he was outside in the middle of like snowing. It wasn't a snowstorm, but it was snowing. He is now completely covered in snow. And he's still curled up, lying down. His parents would say, come on, come on inside. You want to come inside? The dog didn't move. He was totally fine. All, you know, curled up. The blanket was snow. And uh, it was really cute. So use your common sense. And also, if you're putting water out, you got to come up with something. And there are heated water bowls, things that will not let the water freeze. Because guess what? Your dog needs water. And it's going to help, especially in high altitudes. You don't want to put a bowl of water out there because it's going to freeze like everything else. No, you have to have a special kind of bowls or something that, that has some antifreeze in the corner, not inside, obviously. But in the, you know they have these double thick. It's almost like having a thermos with the liquid on the inside that will keep things warm if it's warm, will keep things cold if it's cold. And you can do the same thing with some sort of anti-freezing product. And so the water will stay water so they can drink. Some signs of hypothermia. Well, shivering, obviously, 
pale skin. And when dogs really, an active dog is no longer getting active. They're becoming very, very weak. They have a difficult time moving. They get frostbite on their extremities. It is just like people. And this doctor who lives in a very cold climate, her recommendation is if it's too cold for you, you should assume it's too cold for your dog. So don't assume anything that bad that, oh, no, it's just a dog, or you have that Samoyed, or you have the Husky, or you have the Malamute, right? And you say, oh, go, we're good. We're good. No, 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 no. You may not be good. So, um, you know, keep that in mind. And remember, wind chill, that's why the, the shelter is so important. Wind chill is, it makes it even worse. I'm sure any one of you who has been to Chicago, right, or Minnesota, or I was even in Kansas City in the winter once, that, yeah, you know, when it's windy, it's cold. I was taking a very short walk with the people who were staying at a conference in February in Kansas City. And uh, from our hotel to the little town called the Plaza area, you can actually see where we were going. And it wasn't that far walk. It was a walk across a little park. Then we entered the Plaza and it was two blocks down. No problem. <laughs> Boy, was I mistaken. I, when I got there, finally, I had to check to see if my earlobes were still attached. I felt like I could just crack them off. It was cold. So, you know, just again, you want to keep these things in mind as uh, if you are living in some cold climate because your animals may not be able to handle it. So this continuing education seminar, it's really great. Put on, as I said, by the Colorado Vet Med Association. I, so I was, how it happened with me, how I found out about it was, you know, Colorado Vet Med Association is the CVMA. Well, our association, California Vet Med Association, is the CVMA. So I'm going through my mail, something from the CVMA. I open it and I see it's Colorado. So I was just about to delete. How'd they get me? I'm, I'm, in, I'm in California. I'm not a member of the Colorado Vet Med Association. But the picture caught my eye. It was a picture, a great picture of a skier on a mountain doing some great carving. And it's like, and the snow is flying up. I mean, it looked so amazing. So I read it and it's it talked about skice. And I'm thinking, skice, is that a word? I have to look that up. What is skice? Ah, ski, C-E. And so what they do is it's every year. It is in a Colorado venue. I've been to Breck. I've been to Vail, Crested Butte. Next year, it's going to be in Beaver Creek. I think they've had it in Keystone too. I'd like to go to do that one as well. And they are amazing because it's not like stuffy. It's not a stuffy conference. You Usually it's, it's either a group of speakers or one speaker. In this case, was one speaker, a guy named Dr. Jim Noxon. He's uh, at Iowa State University. Great, great guy, great speaker. And so they do their lecture. We get 12 hours of CE. And for many states, it's, that's pretty close to what you need per year, maybe 15, 18 per year, depending on where, what state. So for the veterinarians, we have so much fun and everyone's in one room. It's not like you in every hour, there are 30 or 40 or 50 talks going on at the same time. And you have to decide which one you want to go to. That was VMX. I just came from um, the week before in Orlando. It's impossible. There's so many talks. Fortunately, now they have them all recorded and you can, you know, if you can only get to one Robbie per one per hour, you can also go back and get the other one. So it's a great CE. So any veterinary people out there, animal health technicians, whatever, RVTs, registered veterinary technicians, if you want to have some really fun, and if you are into skiing or snowboarding, the conditions are great, and it was tons of fun. Anyway, that's all we have time for today here on Pet Life Radio, here on Instagram Live. I will stick around on IG Live a little bit just to answer any questions you may have or to shoot the breeze. And um, otherwise, we will see you here next week as we say, same bat time, same bat channel here on Pet Life Radio. And during the week, if you have any subject matter that you kind of want to discuss, or if your pet is going through something and you just need a little bit more information, veterinarians now are so swamped. We are so busy. I can understand if they just didn't have the time to really go everything with you. Now you have to make decisions. I know on AirVet, I am the virtual vet. A lot of people have their primary vets. And then they make me as their virtual vet because I take some time and I can try to explain things, try to make some sense out of what they're going through and what their veterinarian is recommending and what they should do. Just kind of get, you know, it's just like a, having a little expert in your ear kind of helping you through. So that's what we like to do. So anyway, you can always get a hold of me, obviously, many ways here on Pet Life Radio, Dr. Jeff at PetLifeRadio.com, on Instagram, on AirVet, Jeff at AirVet.com. And uh, we will be happy to talk with you, help you through whatever you're uh, going through. And until then, I will uh, have a great week. We'll see you next week. Be well. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.